Mm -hmm. Here, why don't you begin? I think we have everybody answered now. Okay. Into my, into my. So, ta falciro elikscha, benvenuti a tutti. Benvenuti. Benvenuti is more a pleasure. A doing a knocked, more pleasure. August honor. Kaihamera. Kay McCarthy, a cur a relater. Siamo, siamo entusiasti. We are so happy and satisfied to have Kay McCarthy with us tonight. Oh, and Kay is a cultural icon around these parts. She really is. Oh, yes, no denying it, Kay, no denying it. Uh, she is a musician, a singer, a translator, a historian. She's a founder member of the traditional <laughs> Irish folk group, the Russian group. <laughs> she is, uh, she moved to Ireland and is staying here in Italy since the 70s. So we wanted we wanted to hold an event to celebrate the St. Bridget Day. As you may know, St. Bridget or Bridge in Gaelic uh, is a, a strong female figure of the Irish tradition and, uh, and folklore. And as well as the Imbolc, Imbolc was the first of the first of February and it uh, was the, in the ancient uh, Gaelic calendar was the first day of the spring. So it was the starting of the new of the new season. And when we thought of this, uh, we immediately thought that uh, K would be the perfect uh, uh, person to okay. to no better woman for no the better job. No better one for the no, job. Uh, no better woman Sorry. for the job. K has prepared a fascinating pre uh, presentation for us tonight, based on her own personal recollections on folklore on Irish language, on music, history, and much, much more, of which I have no doubt you are all going to thoroughly enjoy. So, Arini Ushva, while I'm firing the falsha, a Karib K, K. Ramila Mahagas, Ramila Mahagas, Ramila Mahagas, Ramila Mahagas, Ramila Mahagas, Ramila So, welcoming everybody, benvenuti a tutti. Uh, I'll begin immediately because I think I let my imagination run away with me. I was supposed to begin just to speaking about St. Bridget and then I couldn't do it for the first days of February. So I said, we'll begin with her anyway. And the music you heard at the beginning is called Oi Keltoi, which is the Greek for the Celts. And all the musicians who were playing snippets from Irish, Manx, uh, Breton, uh, Welsh and Scottish music are all Italian musicians who now uh, help me when I uh, hold concerts. The last one, unfortunately, we had just in time before COVID put an end to a lot of things on the 30th of January 2020. We were just in time and then the big axe of COVID fell on top of our necks and that was that. So this is just the cover. Uh, I, I apologize to Robert Browning for stealing uh, the title of his uh, poem and uh, fact fiction and fancy. I called it because I grew up in the Galtacht, which means the English uh, part of Ireland, as far away as you can get, unfortunately, from the sea, which I love, but I was very close to lakes in Mullingar and we were blowings and we lived in a special army cocoon, I called it, because uh, being blowings and the native Mullingars, as we call them, the beef to the heels people, were very clannish among themselves, but and they didn't really uh, interact very much with us army people and the army people were a bit uppity too, they could. So it kind of created a cocoon where we were very protected and had no idea of the bad things of the world. We thought they only lived in books, but then, <laughs> and, but at the same time, the cocoon was also alienating because unlike the other uh, girls in my class, because at seven you were separated into boys and girls and sent, to the nuns or to the Christian brothers. And a lot of my friends were so lucky 
that they had their grandparents and their aunts and their uncles and their cousins just around the corner, whereas I had to travel 100 miles to see my granny in New Ross County, Wexford, or up to Dublin to see my cousins and everybody else was very far away. Okay, I think we can go on, Helen, to the first slide. Oh yeah, so these are all of the uh, ideas that they feel are the myths that were taught to us at school, especially the force ones, because uh, we were near Lake Deravara, which was one of the places the four children of Lear lived for 300 years. Then, of course, we were brought up on all the sad stories of Irish mythology. There wasn't one of them that ended up uh, happily. Everybody had to die in the end, even the four swans, um, and Deirdre of the Sorrows, and um, uh, what's his name up there, Cúchalan, and uh, then the only uh, person I was sorry for was the poor wizard who lost his salmon of knowledge, as you can see, Shen McCool is sucking his thumb and he gets the thumb and he gets the wisdom instead of the poor old druid who had spent his life looking for this fish. And the thing is that if you, the first person to eat the flesh of the salmon would know everything that was knowable. And anytime Finn McCool, even when he was a big giant of a hero, when he wanted to know something, used to suck his thumb. And people used to say, isn't that very babyish? But the thing is that the piece of salmon uh, that gave him all his knowledge was what uh, stuck to his thumb when he was distracted while cooking the salmon and he forgot to turn it and he went over and instinctively turned it over with his hand and he burnt his thumb which he brought to his mouth and there was a little bit of salmon stuck to it and that explains it. And up on the top, uh, Helen, there's uh, the only kind of entertainment we had at the time, which was radio wearing. And this was what gave, does it work? It's very short. Okay, so uh, the funny thing was nowadays we're used to having radio, everything, streaming, whatever you like, 24 hours a day, seven hours, days a week. At that time, Radio Aaron, which translates, which transmitted from uh, Athlone, which was just down the road, came on in the morning, I think around eight or nine o'clock. Then it went off the air after the Angelus at midday. Then it came back on again in the afternoon and then it went off the air again. And every time it came on, there was this jingle. And that's why I'm very fond of this little jingle, which is taken from a song called O'Donnell Abu, which is another song I might have time to speak about later on today. Thank you, Helen. We can move on from here. OK. <laughs> So here we actually have St. Bridget herself, who was uh, the reason that I was invited to say something this, this time around. And here on the left, I've got a page from the book where we studied uh, about her, the beginning, number four, what's the name of the first day of spring? And it's called La La Bridge or La and she's also called Muranangail. You can see all these in bold. And I love this script. And I was so angry when they uh, went over to Latin uh, script with all the H's. If you see the little dots over the consonants like ban fatrun, if you forgot uh, to put on your dot, you could always go back and put it in later on. Whereas now, all of these little dots have been replaced with H's. And it's very hard. If I wrote Ban Patron, I couldn't fit in a H between the P and the A nowadays. However, then it also, down at the bottom, it tells you that uh, the 17th on Shock de la Jeg de Huerta is the 17th of March is St. Patrick's Day. So St. Bridget was born in Fahert, the real historic person was born in Fahert, which is north of. Uh, uh, Dundalk, and I was always wondering why a county loud isn't part of Ulster, because it doesn't seem to have a ring of 
uh, uh, Leinster about its pronunciation, I find that the hybrid uh, Dundalk accent, which is not very pleasant to me, I hope there's nobody from Dundalk, I'm not very fond of it. My parents moved there when I uh, came to live in Italy, and I always find the accent is a bit of a hybrid between Meath and um, Down. And it's neither Ulster nor Munster, but I think it's closer to the idea of Monaghan, which is also in uh, Ulster. However, we can go on. So that's uh, Neve Bridge herself. Uh, she's the patron saint. She's a bit like uh, St. Catherine of Siena for Italy. Uh, she's the uh, patroness of Ireland and she goes hand in hand with St. Patrick, but that's another story. Okay, next one, thank you. So here is another lady called Bridge, and she is had the same name, uh, Bridge also called Brigantia, which means the high one. And uh, she was the Celtic pagan goddess of fertility and the spring. So some people say maybe uh, the historical St. Bridget didn't actually exist, but I think she probably did. And it doesn't matter if they had the same name, but we were brought up on this kind of syncretism between uh, paganism and Catholicism and Christianity. And it didn't really matter as children, it was all great fun. Over on the right, you can see an Imbolc uh, celebration, strangely not in Ireland, but in Yorkshire, because we tend to forget, because we presume we are the only Celts on the face of the earth, although I think uh, the Leganog would have something to say about that. These are a group of people in Yorkshire uh, celebrating uh, the 1st of February because even the English celebrate a lot of festivities that were originally Celtic, like the 1st of May with their maypole and all that. And then people or characters like Puck in A Midsummer Night's Dream are really uh, beautified uh, versions of the terrible Puka. Uh, we as children wouldn't have touched a berry on a tree after the 1st of November because the puka had been around poisoning everything and you could die. So that's the kind of person puka was. And there you have the uh, snowdrops in the middle of the snow, which I often saw on the 1st of February. Yes, thank you, Helen. We can move on to... Uh, here on the left, we've got the St. Bridget's Cross, which has got absolutely nothing to do with the swastika, whatever. Uh, it's just that it's the way in which the rushes are uh, woven together. And this is what it looks like uh, two or three days before the 1st of February. Then you hang it either over your door, over the fireplace, and it grows yellow as the year goes by. On the right, you've got what's called babo bridge, which is another little thing we used to make with pieces of straw and cloth to celebrate her. In the middle, we've got uh, the two candles that were used to bless your throat the next day. I think it's done in Italy too. It's a San Biagio, St. Blaise's Day. We actually went to the Franciscans in Multifarnum to have this done. We went on a special expedition to Multifarnum, uh, the Franciscan, uh, because Mullingar only had a cathedral, which was the cathedral of the Diocese of Meath, and we had the bishop and the whole lot. Mullingar was very important. It was the capital city of the county of West Meath. Mullingar at Long Moat and Kilbegan were the four uh, important towns, and we learned that off when we went to school, we were told we had to remember these important towns. Okay, thank you. Next, oh, yeah, here you've got the idea as Salvatore was saying that the first of spring in the Celtic calendar was the first of February. And here you've got saying, there are four seasons in a year, Marathon Tarak, and then it gives you the alternative of between spring, uh, summer was the 1st of May, uh, the 1st of August was Lunasa and was the beginning of autumn, etc. So, but uh, to explain it, people said, well, didn't you know your astronomy, you Celts? We did, just we liked symmetry. 
and we used to put the things at the center instead of at the beginning of the season, six and a half weeks leading up to and six and a half weeks leading away from. Uh, so that's why the solstices and the equinoxes are at the center and not the beginning of the seasons. In fact, even uh, Shakespeare's Midsummer Night Dream was uh, performed for the first time around the 24th of June, because the Midsummer Day, even for the English way back in Shakespeare's time, was uh, around the 21st of June. So it was in the middle between the 1st of May and the 1st of August. So that explains the enigma of a Midsummer Night's Dream being held in June, even by Shakespeare. Right, another week in Adelante. Yes, so here we've got two different representations, one in English, the other, Australia, of the circle of the year, because the Celts had an, an idea that time was circular, it just kept uh, like a wheel. And you can see the divisions that you've got in bulk, which is the one I put sitting up straight that's the one we're talking about uh, the first of february then bialtana is although i've heard it called beltane but it's bialtana the first of may lunasa is august and Samhain is of course what you know as halloween which i detest in the americanized uh, version but that's another story again you see that uh, there are also other names like candlemas is the second of february May Day is the 1st of May, Lamas is the 1st of August, and uh, All Hallows is Halloween, of course. And there's also a fair in Ballycastle in the north of Ireland, which is called the Lamas Fair. And you went to Ballycastle, oh, and you ate Dulce and Yellow Man on, at the fair in Ballycastle. Okay, thank you. So here on the left, uh, is something that both Helen and myself know very well. It's a mosaic in Mullingar Cathedral representing St. Patrick lighting the famous fire on the hill of Tara when it was uh, the time of the year that all the flames had to be put out and the druids had to light the fire to celebrate the beginning of the new season and he lit uh, the fire, and you can see even uh, the he raw. You remember? Did any of you see the film called the Miss uh, about the Book of Kells, the cartoon, the full length animation film about the Book of Kells? And you remember the famous page that Brendan was supposed to do with um, Saint? I can't remember. It was one from the center of Ireland, anyway, who was over in the Isle of. Uh, uh, Iona, and it's called the he ro, and that's they're the two letters, the he and the ro, which are the he and the r from the Greek alphabet, and they're uh, very important. They stand for Jesus Christ. And down on the right, if you can manage to see them, they're not very clear. Are the famous serpents on their way out, and also the idols of Krom and uh, so on that are being broken to pieces by God who has sent uh, a thunderbolt down from heaven to destroy them. Whereas on the right, you've got a classical um, window from somewhere I didn't check, I just found it online, of St. Patrick dressed as a bishop with the famous shamrock in hand. And we'll speak about that in the next uh, slide. There's no music here, no. Oh, so here we have it. I used to think, of course, we were told as children that God showed <laughs> St. Uh, Patrick uh, a shamrock growing beside his toe. And he picked it up when he was trying to explain the mystery of the Trinity to the poor Irish. But they didn't need to be instructed in that most of the pagan religions of the time, including the Celtic religion, all had uh, gods and goddesses that came with three persons. So it doesn't matter. Anyway, we'll put it on our coats every 17th of March anyway. But uh, I don't think St. Patrick would have had to explain uh, the idea of Trinity to the Irish. They were already uh, familiar with that. 
The one on the right is actually the Greek representation of a goddess. She's got three faces. Then you've got the Gaulish one on top. And I think the one on the bottom is Roman. They were called the Matres. However, uh, we're not going to go into Greek and Roman culture this evening. Uh, next one, please. So here I wanted to speak about uh, the oral tradition. This is something that struck me. I was a teacher as well here in this country, and I was always amazed that my students wanted to write everything down when there was no need to write things down. Because I think that we who come from the Irish tradition are used to listening and paying attention to what people say rather than writing everything down or taking notes. And uh, in fact, even the Druids with their OM uh, alphabet, the one on the left, you can see all the various, um, uh, all you need is a, a vertical or horizontal line and you put in the uh, marks from one to five. But uh, it seems that the Druids also put uh, letters on each fingertip and on each phalange of their hands, and they could uh, send messages if they knew, I'm sure they were very efficient, and they could signal at a distance to one another. On the right, you have the uh, 18 letter Irish alphabet. We can do a lot of things with only 18 letters, and you'd be surprised, of, although each vowel has two uh, it's got a, a short and a long, like a uh, and a, uh, and o uh, and o uh, and e and e and e uh, and a uh, and o uh, and u uh, and so on. And all of the consonants, once they got a little dot, or most of them, except um, n and uh, r, I think, and l, all of the others could have a little dot on top called shevu, which changed, for example, a k to h an M to W, a V, uh, a B to V or W, and so on. And uh, so with 18 letters, we could write everything. And then, of course, you've got groups of uh, vowels, which seem to create like, uh, and also we've got another sound in the back of our throat for the vowels, like you don't say skull, you say skull. So you have to kind of open the back of your throat to say the word school in uh, Irish. And uh, unfortunately, because it was so expensive to make all these types of uh, to create books in Irish, at one stage, they went into a kind of panic and they decided they were going to adopt the uh, Latin alphabet and the beautiful uh, pages in Uncial type, which was a Roman kind of type anyway, disappeared and gave way. You see um, all of the names of the trees. Uh, oh, by the way, afterwards, I'll tell you. All of the names of the letters are names of plants and trees, which I think is fascinating. Also, uh, the Druids believed that you could cure or kill with a plant or a tree, and the same way you could kill or uh, console with a word. This is an interesting link between verbal language and nature itself, that as they say, the word is mightier than the sword. Haha. <laughs> okay, let's go on. <laughs> Next one. Ah, oh, yeah, here is my kitchen on the left. As you can see, the things hanging up uh, around the sink. And I had a friend of mine made, make a special tile with a tiny, with three words from the um, Book of Kells. On the right is the god, the old uh, god from the Tuha de Danan, who gave the name Oam to the kind of alphabet uh, that we saw above, the one on the hand and the one with all the strokes. And you couldn't have written very much with that alphabet. Uh, you could only put inscriptions on a stone or a piece of wood. Uh, it's like, as, as I say, if you wanted to do mathematics with Roman, Roman numerals, you can't. You can only uh, use them for inscription, the same way the Oum alphabet. And this is Oum, who was supposed to have had a tongue of honey, and uh, it was golden. And all these chains 
from his tongue went out into the ears of the people whom he was able to uh, okay. he was able to convince to do what he wanted because his his tongue was mellifluous and uh, all the chains you can see in the drawing that the chains go from his tongue to the ears of the people below. So he was the Lord of, and the God of language. And according to the tradition, when the Tower of Babel fell down, he ran over and collected all the best pieces to compose the Irish language, which is supposed to be the best of all languages because it's got all the best pieces from the old Tower of Babel. Of course, thereby hangs a prejudice and a tale, but we like to believe it anyway. Next. What's next? Oh yeah, here are the actual trees and plants uh, that the music I think doesn't work. We tried it yesterday and for some, or does it? No, it says unavailable. Sorry about that, but uh, I can always send it to you again. So, and these, when you, my mother went to school, when they spelt anything, they had to spell them like, if I was saying my name K, let's imagine K is Carl. I would say Carl, Alim, uh, Lae would be I, I. So that's the way they used to spell. And I don't know why the Minister of Education under De Valera at one uh, stage thought we were all stupid as kids. I think we're very intelligent and we can learn anything. Uh, they decided that we were going to say A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. So that was the end of teaching people the traditional names of the letters of the alphabet. Yes, next please. Oh, here I've got on the left, uh, the letter A as given in the famous beautiful Denin dictionary. It's the equivalent for people who have studied Greek like Rocci for the Greek language here in Italy. And it tells you alum, the elm tree. Whereas if you look down below, this is the modern uh, English uh, uh, Irish alphabet and it doesn't tell you anymore that it's alum. On the right, there is a, a translation of a very famous Italian work by Monsignor de Brun, who studied in Rome, and he decided to translate this extremely famous work into Irish. Uh, the work contains three parts, but he died before he only finished the first. Anybody able to guess what it might be? Nel mezzo del cammino di nostra vita is the first line. So it's Dante and the Inferno. And Don, it means canto. Don is poem, but it's also canto, primo canto. He was excellent. He even did it with the rhyme and the, um, and the rhythm. It's very difficult to translate from one language to another, especially poetry. And then if you make it metrical, it's even more difficult. So well done. Monsignor de Brun. Unfortunately, he died before he got to live, um, come si chiama? Purgatorio and uh, um, Paradiso. So he only did the Inferno, but I've got it and uh, it's got the Italian facing. So I can look at the Irish here and the Italian uh, testo a fronte. What's it called? Dual language. I've gone native. I think of some things more in Italian than in English, unfortunately. Never mind. Yes, thank you, Helen. So here I think we've got uh, one of the important moments in Irish history because my father used to train the FCA around the Mullingar area in the afternoons in the winter. And he took me for company in his little Ford Anglia. And when we went around to these little villages all around County Westmeath and County Longford, he would tell me stories about the history of Ireland. I don't know how uh, faithfully historical they were, but the important thing was that he told me about his favorite characters. And this was the terrible Battle of Kinsale, which put an end after the Nine Years' War against Elizabeth I 
to the Gaelic order. It was the beginning of the end. And I used to get very upset about this. You can see the Spanish galleons here uh, who came to try and help the Irish, but Kinsale was a disaster also for the fact that the leaders of the war against Elizabeth were all from Ulster. And I don't know why they had to march the whole way down to uh, Kinsale in County Cork, where they didn't know the land to engage in a battle with the uh, English uh, Navy. However, and this is the music that I, I was brought on up on very, very solemn, pompous uh, music that celebrated the triumph of anything that was Irish. So Helen, we can listen to a few uh, seconds of this. It gives you the idea. Oh. Okay, so we can. No, uh, this is called Roskahanamun, which for some strange quirk of uh, circumstance has also become Boyne Water. It's the same melody uh, that the Protestants of the Wee North uh, use on the 12th of July, one of the few pieces of music they actually uh, play, but they borrow mostly. Uh, from the Irish tradition, uh, regardless of their tendencies. And uh, the only other thing I think they play on that occasion is Lily Bolero, which was written actually by an English composer. Okay, so that's the Battle of Kinsale. And here, after the terrible uh, defeat, the three principal uh, heroes of the debacle left Ireland and it's called Imok Ninirli. We used to call it Teha, the flight of the Earls. And this is just about the going away of the Earls. The flight, it says on the left, but we were told that the flight was Teha and not Imok. However, do you con confirm this, Kira, that it should be Teha, the flight? Uh, yeah, well, that's yeah, yeah, okay, just yeah. by the way, but here they put it in Imak. So they left because although they had reached an agreement with James I, because Elizabeth was dead when they actually sat down to the treaty, she had died before uh, they, for, they signed the treaty in 1603. And the Irish didn't know they were actually signing a treaty with James I of, of England, who was James VI of Scotland and then uh, their lives were in danger so they decided to come here and according to the English idea of property the head of the clan was the owner of the land he abandoned whereas for the Celtic concept of property the, the land belonged to the clan but uh, that was a clash uh, between uh, ideas of property uh, and the English said okay they have abandoned uh, their land, so we are going to uh, sequester all of this, and that was the beginning of the plantation of Ulster, which is another long, 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 long story. We won't go into it this evening. Okay, next. This is um, supposed to be uh, O'Sullivan Bear, and um, his uh, lament over his departure from Ireland. He was arrested because he took part in the Battle of Kinsale. And uh, his lament is very famous and it has been revisited and had a, another text in English set to it across the ocean. But I prefer uh, this original version, Askoilge. Thank you, Helen. We can listen to a little bit of it.
Okay, so that is the original version of Danny Boy. I prefer this, obviously, uh, to the romantic American uh, text. And the arranger and director of this particular choir is another man from Malingar. Uh, his name is, or was, I presume he's still alive, Sean Kramer. And he uh, grew up uh, around the corner from friends of ours who lived in Austin Friar Street, if that means anything to Helen. Okay, next. So here is where one of the early, the earls who fled from uh, Northern Ireland, he was O'Neill of Tyrone, which is Tyrone nowadays. And he's buried in San Pietro in, uh, what you call it, uh, Salvatore, <laughs> in Montorio, in Rome near the Irish embassy. And that's the a piece of marble in the floor that tells you where his bones are supposed to be because it says ossa and that in both uh, Latin and Italian means bones. Okay, <laughs> and you can play them. Oh, so here are my three heroes. So they were obviously short of names at the time. All three of them are called A, which in uh, English is, trun uh, is translated Hugh, Ugo in Italian. And two of them had red hair. You can't see on Donald's red hair. You can see O'Neill's red hair. And they're both, the two O'Neill and O'Donnell are also called a Rua, which means red hue. Uh, fortunately, Che Maguire, uh, there's Maguire in the middle who was dark haired. And he came from uh, Fermanagh. And the other two came from what is called Donegal, I still call it Tyrconnell. And the other, uh, O'Neill, came from Tyrone. And here is, the, again, another rousing patriotic song <laughs> that came from my childhood, O'Donnell Abu. It's from an old record. You can hear the... Uh, And these were the three characters that my father used to tell me about uh, during our uh, drives through the country in the dark, like it was dark at four o'clock. So uh, we went to train these, our daddy trained them anyway, these FCA, Forza Cosento Ocula people, who are all uh, young farmers or farmhands who love to get a free a pair of boots, they got very solid army boots and a lovely woolly uh, um, uniform. So uh, that kept them happy and they learned how to shoot a rifle or two and uh, then they went on maneuvers to Finner Camp up in Donegal every summer. So that's the story of these. When you've had enough, you can tell me I can some people might be interested in having their dinner. We can go on to the next uh, uh, slide. Okay, so this is nature presenting us with the Irish flag. As you can see, the evergreens, the sky and the autumn leaves on the other side. And you know that Ireland has a lot of deciduous forest and that accounts for the orange leaves. But somebody uh, was inspired, I don't know, I found this photo on uh, the internet and was thrilled to find that nature had uh, reproduced uh, the Irish tree color. I don't know what song I put in here, whatever it is, we listen to it anyway, I don't remember. Ah yes, I'll tell you afterwards. Thank you. 
Now I remember, the thing is that Ireland naturally was a forest and uh, there were lots of woods and forests in Ireland until the time of Oliver Cromwell and they began cutting and this song is from that period when uh, the English began cutting the woods. They needed the timber, I think, to build ships and industrialization was beginning. They needed them to produce steam before they began digging coal uh, to uh, drive mill wheels and what have you. And this uh, is called um, um, come on, what's it? I think it's a guy called, um, I can't remember him now. Ah, Sean O'Dwyer, that was his name. And he's crying because the woods are being cut and he's going to leave Ireland because he can't live with the people who are cutting the woods. So it's, uh, I think Ireland and Britain are two of the European countries with the uh, lowest percentage of uh, woodland nowadays, unfortunately, and it goes back to that period. Okay, next. So here, the last time, I think it was Kira's father sang this song to us, Shula Gra, and this is the text on the left that he sang, and the type is even older than the kind of type uh, they were in the books that we studied at school. You can see that uh, there's the older spelling. Shul has a B in, in the Angra as a D with a dot at the end. And then the R and the S, um, where can I see? Don't worry too much about it. If any of you want to have a copy of this, you can ask. Uh, Aurasigshan, they'll, I hope, uh, be able to send it to you and you can study it. And here is my version of the same song where the, um, the verse is in English and the refrain in Irish. And that's the version on the right. And this song in various versions, uh, Scottish, Irish, uh, monolingual, bilingual, was um, in memory of the fact that when we supported the Stuart family, as they say in Romana, l'abbiamo presa in Sacoccia, uh, that we supported the uh, Stuart family as did the Highlands and the Islands of Scotland. And we both paid uh, this loyalty, but we dreamt that they might come back and save us again. But 
uh, that was a pipe dream uh, that didn't do either of the countries any good. However, that's another story. Thank you, Helen. Next one. Ah, uh, here is where I went on my summer holidays. The little house on the left is the house I actually lived in during the summer. That's my granny's house. And it's in outside in the country near New Ross. And New Ross is the place uh, that, from which, a little place out in the country from which Kennedy's ancestors uh, fled during the Irish potato famine. And the town is actually down on the river Barrow, which you see on the right. But the top of the town is up very high and you can go up uh, stairs. In fact, the people in Euros always say, I'm going upstairs to the Irish town. Uh, at least they used to when they walked. People didn't have cars a lot back then. And uh, here I was absolutely, uh, what would you say? Uh, imbued with ferocious 1798 feeling and who fears to speak of 98 and the wearing of the green and the crappy boy. And I stayed two months every year all on my own. I didn't need other children. I was taken here and there by all the, all the adults because there, was a, uh, there were very few young people, young couples because most of the people had emigrated to England. But I was the darling of the whole uh, countryside and I was thrilled to be the center of the universe. And uh, I haven't changed much <laughs> since then. And uh, they took me to do all kinds of lovely things like gathering hay and milking goats and uh, so on. And uh, I think that up on the left, we've got a bit of the wearing of the green by Luke Kelly of the Dubliners. Thank you very much. I'd like to sing. Uh... A rebel song, which I'm very proud to be able to sing because it was sung by a great man of labour in Ireland called James Larkin. It's called The Rising of the Moon. At the rising of the moon, at the rising of the moon. With your pike upon your shoulder at the rising of the moon. And come tell me, Sean O'Farrell, tell me why you hurry so. Hush, a vocal, hush and listen, and his cheeks were all aglow. I bear orders okay. from the captain, get you ready for them. Ready for them. Okay, I wanted to say the photograph on the left is from the day that Kennedy actually visited Muros. I was there among that big crowd there somewhere. And I was so proud because the man standing uh, beside him was a friend of the family. So I felt slightly uh, important, although I couldn't talk to Kennedy uh, personally. I could touch the hand of the man who had shaken hands with him. And up on the right, we have got the monument to the uh, fallen of 1798 in the Irish town in Neuros. The Irish town was up on the top. And uh, that's where I learned to sing The Croppy Boy, which is the other song on the right there. It begins soft. It was early, early in the spring The birds did whistle and did sweetly sing Changing the notes from tree to tree The song they sang, it was old Ireland free Okay, I used to stand on my grandmother's kitchen table and sing all of these things on a Saturday evening because the house was at a crossroads and they had a Cayley every Saturday during uh, the summer because not only there was no electricity or running water, they had candles and she had a battery radio. You had to have two batteries, a dry and a liquid one, which was full of terrible acid. And uh, people also came on a Sunday to hear uh, the hurling and the um, 
the football matches and Michal O'Hare was the commentator and sometimes he his commentary was Australia and so they'd say what's he saying what's he saying <laughs> so, um, my grandmother came from County Kerry and knew enough Irish to be able to tell them as well what Michal O'Hare was saying okay next uh, are we okay time wise this instead is the record that Salvatore remembers that I made with the group called Roshindu. And uh, I found this on YouTube and somebody took the trouble of playing this song, sung by me and using uh, Corto Maltese to illustrate some of the cliches uh, that people imagine about Ireland. But because it's Ugo Pratt, we forgive him for his use of cliche. Okay. It's very funny. I was listening to my pronunciation in English here. I was a teacher of English at the time. And I noticed listening to this the other day that I, um, uh, I pronounced a lot of words as if I were teaching English uh, to people who had to get R, P, receive pronunciation. So it's a very strange <laughs> uh, kind of pronunciation and it uh, spilt over into the bold thing in men. However, that was a long, long time ago. Right, so next. Uh, no, and this instead is uh, a lullaby in Manx Gaelic, which I uh, found in a little book. As you can see, the script is uh, using uh, the Latin alphabet and it's called and it's about a little birdie, uh, a red bird who is very uh, fanciful, would like to sleep in places that are out of the question, like the top of the tree and the foam on a wave, and then he has to learn to be uh, pragmatic and sleep in a bed. That's roughly what it's about. A little rebel issued via Grua. <laughs> Okay, um, the Isle of Man, a lot of people in Italy think the Isle of Man is l'Isola del Uomo, it's not. Uh, Ilin Vanen, which is the island of Mananon Maclear, and as you know, Mananon Maclear is the Celtic god of the sea, and Lear was his father, and I think 
it's funny that his name should coincide with the king in Shakespeare's tragedy because uh, Lear had to give up his um, kingdom to his son Mananon when he went into utter despair because his four children had been turned into four swans. So uh, the four swans at the beginning have got to do with the fact that Lear uh, abdicated in favor of his son Mananon and the name was given to the island, which according to tradition is the big piece of earth that uh, Finn McCool took out of Northern Ireland where Loch Ness is and threw it into the middle of the Irish Sea, which accounts for Loch Ness and the Isle of Man simultaneously, of course. I'm glad to say it's a myth. <laughs> okay, thanks. I think we're nearly at the end, aren't we? Oh, we are. So we were really very good. So I said down with walls. And this is to honor Kira in particular, because this is a primary school in Derry City, which some people are now calling Stroke City, <laughs> because I think it's London Derry Derry, and they've decided that sometimes it's London Derry. I can never get around to calling it uh, London Derry, because Derry means the uh, oak grove, and because it comes from Dar, which is uh, the oak tree and then uh, it was the place where the oak tree tree grew and you know that the druid is the person who knows the dar dri is the person who knows the oak tree and thereby hangs uh, the last of my tales but this is well worth a listen a complete listen and with that after that we'll sign off and you can go and have your dinner <laughs> So thank you very much for your attention. I'm glad that um, it wasn't too much. I didn't say, I decided I'd just devote about a minute or a little bit more to each slide so that you could have this carillata, as they say, of uh, uh, just home thoughts from abroad. So, we hope that you are back with okay, us. Okay, I think uh, if you're interested, I love making uh, PowerPoints. I'm not, I don't make ones that kind of slide from one slide into the other, all that kind of thing, but I make very straightforward. Uh, and thanks, Helen. 
much. You you were really good and you understood my hand gestures. Uh, no, <laughs> and I, uh, I don't know how, if anybody was listening uh, this evening, can you send a copy? Uh, if they want it, they can enjoy it fully. I mean, the musical part, because we just gave a little listen uh, yeah. of various things. Uh, okay, anybody got any questions? I promise that uh, I would allow people to ask me things, but it was such a potpourri of everything. Uh, well, maybe. <laughs> well, okay, first of all, just Guru Mila Mila Maigit. You're more than welcome. I enjoyed it, it and I love making the really fascinating it betrays my past as a teacher <laughs> well you know um you, you it was you know illuminating fascinating also so personal you know you you, you mentioned you know having gone native being lived, living having lived here for such in a long Italy, time yes but i have there's a there you can't take the woman out of ireland okay that's very sure we can see that very clearly no, but that's what I've spent my uh, years trying to do is I bring Ireland with me. I don't need to be there to enjoy Ireland. And um, although I fell in love with the idea of Italy because I suffered so much from the cold as a child, I said, when I grow up, I'm going to go to a land where oranges grow on trees. I, not exactly in Rome. I've seen them in the Irish College, but they, they're not edible and up on the Palatine Hill. Uh, but I think you have to go further south. I've no regrets. And I fell madly in love with Rome. And then I married, uh, like yourself, I married a local, uh, a man from the south. Piero is actually from uh, Puglia. So, but he, we met in Rome and that's being personal again, but I've no regrets. We uh, will be 50 years married on in July. My show, gorgeous love, gorgeous love. How Anybody ever wants? Uh, I'll think of something. Maybe I can come back as a feature now and then. Uh, I can suggest things because I've got loads of powerpoints already that I've presented here in Montefiascone. Or well, the titles to. are in Italian, but I just have to change the titles. The material is uh, ready. On the 17th of March, I am presenting a book that's about in Montefiascone, that's about your hometown. I don't know if you've read it. It's Can about Derry. Closer, okay? We can't see the. Oh, well, can't this you? This man's wee boy. This yes. man's wee boy. It's about Derry and the Troubles and Bloody Sunday. Oh, I, indeed. Um, and Tony fact, Doherty. Yes, yes. And it's been translated into Italian, in so. In fact, it was, yes, indeed. Yes, yes. Um, and Tony my O'Doherty friends here are going. Tony O'Doherty. Yes. yes. Uh, and my friends here are reading, they've got their homework, they have to read the translation, which okay. in some cases, it's actually quite well translated. Also, you lose some of the humor and the nuances of being, uh, you would probably get even more out of it than I do because coming from Derry itself, uh, but you get the Irish sense of uh, being very dramatic, but not taking things too seriously either. Like you can be bittersweet about certain things and uh, you can be tragic and humoristic at the same time, which I think is a feature of the Irish character. Uh, okay. Um, okay, I, I would like to say Guramila Maigat again. Yeah. Um, I would before we, we do part company because I'm I know I know we're kind of conscious of people going for their dinners and whatnot. Just briefly at Roshin do are is there would there be any any plans for you guys to get back together again or do you meet up or how are things? With the members of the group. Okay, you are you are muted. Your microphone. The microphone is. Okay, so that yes, can you hear me again? No, because uh, once I left the Roshindu, I set up my own group, and uh, wherever I do concerts now, I do it with the uh, uh, the present formation, but. We know I I know that they they still exist and they went through a number of metamorphoses since I left them and I think from an instrumental point of view they actually improved 
Uh, I won't say anything about their singing. <laughs> okay, we have a question from Barbara. Barbara. Okay, Barbara, where are you? You can ask. I'm here. Uh, I can. We need to unmute Barbara. Let's see. Barbara, are you able to unmute? Let's see. How can we do that? Carmen, Helen, Tom, uh, Barbara, there's. She was yeah. there a moment ago. Yeah, she's um, over there, but she's she's muted. I see little. Yeah, can you unmute Barbara? Can I, no, may I not? Um, can you hear me? Yes, Barbara. Yes, now I can hear you. Kay, I wanted to say what a beautiful presentation you gave us. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm delighted. And we'd love more of those. I'd love to meet you sometime. I'm here 50 years like yourself. Where are you in Rome? I'm yeah, I'm near Villada. Near Villada. Yeah, where are you? I'm in Montefiascone, but I used to live in uh, near St. John's. And we yeah. sang every year for about 14 years in Villada during the Villada festival every summer. No, and I can hear that from my terrace, would you believe? I never realized that. So we were there every year doing our bit. <laughs> oh, so we'll get in touch somehow. I'd love to meet Why you. not, indeed? Uh, my uh, tradition this time is um, Susanna Pellis because she was the one who asked me if I'd like to uh, do something for Oris And yeah. uh, because I'm a great friend of Susanna's, I said yes. So it's been, uh, she's the one who can be blamed <laughs> or, has, no, 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 or no, have no. the merits of putting us <laughs> into contact. Uh, because for years I've been following her Irish Film Festa and I'm always uh, delighted to turn up at Castle Bill Cinema to see what she has. She's an expert. It, it, was, it was like having a guest in the house for the evening. A million thanks. A, a little Kaylee. <laughs> a little Kaylee. A little Kaylee. Good for you. Hey, may I? God bless you. I'll find you somehow. Okay. You will. You will. Okay. God bless you. Bye. Thank you, bye. Barbara. Bye. Thank you, Thank you so much. Yeah. And um, before we before we draw to a close, I just want to draw your attention to all the lovely comments that people have made. So we have from Ma Gracia Maria. Uh, thank you for this lovely musical evening. It was moving to listen to you after many years. We have one from Lucia. Thank you all. And Kay in particular, it was very interesting. Look, looking forward to the next meeting from Eve Atuti Gurumayagats. Uh, fabulous, okay. Uh, Gurumayagat, Gurumila Mayagat from Sharon and Derry, from Paolo and is still up there. from Daniela. Thank you so much for this treasure trove of memories, myths, and beauty. And we have from, excuse me if I'm not pronouncing people's names correctly. I think this is from Gilbert. Uh, to the, thank you so much, Kay. Lovely. And Stefania Botti, thank you. And Bernadette. Thank you so much for this fantastic hour of history, language, and music. Please, can we have more of them? So there you go. Thanks. Thank you. You're more than welcome. <laughs> because I was lucky enough to study history with the GA Hayes McCoy in Galway. So that because I have ancestors from Ulster, Leinster, and Munster, I needed something from Connacht. So I went to the university there. So I've completed my uh, geographical background. <laughs> so thanks, thank and a special thank thanks to thank 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 Susanna and you. Helen, thank and both of Alla the host. Thank you, Kay. Thank you. Grazie. Okay, ciao a tutti e buon cena. Buona cena. Grazie, grazie. Ciao. ciao. ciao.